Welcome, let's discuss the open-ended questions for the geometry regions for January 2023. In our first question, we would like to use our compass and a straight edge to construct an angle bisector on angle ABC. So let's get our compass. Well, the first thing that we want to do is let's identify where is angle ABC, which we have it here on the left-hand side. So now let's concentrate on the vertex of this angle, which is point B. Let's get our compass and place the metal label in that vertex, which we have it there. Now we're just gonna open our compass a little bit because we are going to create an arc. And what we would like to do is, we would like to intersect our triangle at two different locations, which we have it here. At this point over here, and at this point over here. Now that we have those two intersections, let's place the metal leg at the bottom of those intersections. And now let me rotate my compass and this is the full distance of those two intersections. Let me just close it a little bit. And what I would like to do, as long as I'm more than half of that distance, which is okay, this is more than half, I'm going to create a mark on the inside of my triangle. And I'm going to do the same without changing the distance of my compass. I'm going to move my metal leg at the other intersection. Notice that I haven't changed the length of my compass. And now, I'm going to look for the intersection with the arc that I have made previously. And we are done. Because now let me move my compass to the side. If I connect that intersection with the vertex of our triangle, I have created our angle bisector. We can claim that the left hand side of this angle it is equal to the right hand side of this angle. In question 26, we're being given two triangles triangle ABC which is right here on the left, and triangle DEF, which is right here on the right. We would like to describe a sequence of rigid motions. So let's stop there. So if we are discussing rigid motions, we are only allowed to do the following. A translation, a rotation, and a reflection. And what we would like to do is use these three actions and we would like to map triangle ABC into triangle DEF. And what's important to notice is that because we're using rigid motions, these two triangles are congruent to each other. Well, because they're congruent, then let me start identifying corresponding parts. The first letter in our congruent statement will be congruent to the first letter in our congruent statement. So this angle of A, after these rigid motions, it should land on angle D. And the same goes with the second letters. Angle B should land with angle E. So angle B should land in angle E. And lastly, angle C should land in the last letter, which you can barely see it there as angle F. Well, the first thing that I notice is that there seems to be some kind of a rotation going on here. Because notice that this green angle of angle A, it is at the top and then it ends up being on the right. It's kind of like this triangle got pushed over the edge to the right hand side. And the same goes with angle C. Notice that angle C was on the left and then it ended up being on the top. So it's kind of like if you just got pushed somewhere around here. So perhaps the first action or rigid motion, it is some form of a rotation. Well, how about if we rotate it around point B? Let's make point B our center of rotation. And let's start by rotating 90 degrees clockwise. So let's start looking at distance. The distance that C is to B, it is of two units going to the left. So after that rotation, it is going to be two units vertically. So it is here where we're going to identify C prime. And the same goes with A. A was four units going up from point B. After a rotation of 90 degrees, it is going to be four units going to the right. So it is here where we're going to identify A prime. So let's identify the triangle that we have just created after the first rigid motion of rotation. And now notice that we have the same orientation. The triangle that we obtain after the first rotation, 
it has the same orientation as the triangle that we wanted to match. The blue point is on the top, the purple is on the bottom left, and the green is on the bottom right. So how about now we create a translation or a movement? Let's choose one point. If I want to match point A to point D, I need to move three units to the right and also four units down. Well, let's see if that's the case for all the points. Now let's get the purple point and let's move it three units to the right and four units down. Notice there's also matching at point E. And the same should be about point C, the blue point. C prime, let's move it three units to the right and four units down. And notice that we're also matching that same location. So we are done. The sequence of rigid motions that we can create is to first create a rotation of 90 degrees clockwise and then create a translation of three units to the right and four units down. And when we do that, we are going to be matching triangle ACB with triangle FED. In question 27, we are being given a symmetrical roof frame which has a height of 4 feet and it has a width of 24 feet. And what we would like to know is to the nearest degree, what is the angle of elevation for the roof frame? And in this scenario, if we consider this angle on the bottom left hand side, this is how much of an angle we need to open up to create this roof. This is what we're going to define as our angle of elevation. And when we consider this angle of elevation, when it reaches the top, we can create a perpendicular line at the bottom that will meet with the other section of the angle of elevation. And now we can work with this right triangle. Well, let's draw that triangle here on the side. On the left hand side, we got our angle of elevation. But one thing that we know is that the height is four feet, which is the same that we have here on the right hand side of our figure. We have a right triangle here at the bottom. Now, another thing to consider is that we are working with a symmetrical roof frame. So that means that when we take a look at the top of the roof frame, that top is exactly in the middle of the base. And if it's at the middle of the base, then it's fair to say that this section, it is of a value of 12. And this second section, it is of a value of 12. Now the base that we had got cut into two congruent sides. So let's put that information here in our triangle. So now we got 12. And now that we have a right triangle, if we want to find an angle, we have to use trigonometric functions. Well, let's start by labeling our triangle. The side that is opposite of the reference angle, that is the opposite side, which in this case is going to be 4. The side that is opposite of 90 degrees, that's our hypotenuse. And whatever it's left, that's our adjacent. So within this figure, in our triangle, we have information about our adjacent, and we have information about the opposite as well. And if we remember our acronym of SOCATOA, the function that uses opposite and adjacent, it is tangent. So we will use the tangent function. So let's write that down. The tangent of our reference angle, it is equivalent to opposite, which is 4, over adjacent, which is 12. And now if we want to solve for the angle, let's multiply by the tangent of inverse on both sides. That way the tangent cancels out, and now we have our reference angle, which is going to be equivalent to the inverse of tangent evaluated at 4 over 12. And when we put this down in our graphing calculator, we're going to get approximately 18 degrees. In question 28, we have a directed line segment AB. So when we're working with directed line segments, there is a direction. And within the statement, we started with letter A, 
And then the second letter was B. Then the direction, it is from A going to B. So let's keep that in mind. Now the endpoints of this line segment at A is negative 2, 5. And at B, it's 8, comma, negative 1. So let's roughly sketch this location. So let's say that we have some kind of a coordinate plane. Negative 2, 5 should be somewhere around here. And 8, comma, negative 1, it should be somewhere around here. So let's just keep those points. So here we have the line segment that we're discussing. Now, we would like to know is what is the location of some point? Let's call it P. That will divide the line segment into a ratio. 3 to 2. Well, if this line segment, it gets divided into a ratio of 3 to 2, then this means that there are going to be five equal parts. So let's get this line segment and try to divide it into five equal sections. So there we have it. So now we can kind of claim that the location of P is going to be exactly here. But to find the location of P, we are not going to consider the diagonal distance, but we're going to consider the vertical and horizontal distance. To find the vertical distance, let's find the difference among the Y values. So if you start a Y of 5 and you go down to a Y of negative 1, you are traveling 6 points. So we have a length of 6. And to find the horizontal distance, let's find the difference between the X values. If you start at negative 2 and you go to 8, you're traveling 10 units. The same way that we divided the diagonal distance by 5 points, let's do the same with the vertical. And let's do the same with the horizontal. So now let's concentrate on the vertical distance. Let's find the length of each of those pieces that we have here in our vertical distance. The total length is 6 and we want 5. Then we're going to get 6 and we're going to divide by 5. And that's going to give us 1.2. So what we are saying is that every single section that we have here has a length of 1.2. Well, let's do the same for the length of the horizontal pieces. So we had a total of 10, and we want 5 equal parts. So now we can say that every length that we have here, it is of a value of 2. Now to find the location of P, Notice that what we could have done, we could have started at A and move three pieces diagonally. But we do not know what's the length of each of those diagonal pieces. Instead of moving three sections diagonally, we could also move three sections down and three sections to the right. But the benefit is that we know what is the length of each of those vertical pieces and each of those horizontal pieces. So let's use that information. So to find the location of P, we can start at the x-coordinate of A. And then we move three of those sections to the right. But if we move into the right, we are adding x values. Well, how many sections are we adding? We are adding three of those sections. And the length of each of those sections was of a value of 2. That is going to give us the x-coordinate of the point of P. So now let's find the y-coordinate of the point of P. We're going to approach it the same way. How about we get the y-value of A, which is 5. And then acknowledge that we're moving three sections down. But if you're moving down, you're not adding y-values, but you're subtracting y-values. You will be subtracting three sections where the length of each of those sections is equivalent. 1.2. So we are done. This computation is going to give us the x value over the coordinate point, and this computation is going to give us the y value of the coordinate point of P. So let's compute them. 3 times 2, that is 6, minus 2, that is 4. 
3 times 1.2, that is equivalent to 3.6, and if we subtract that from 5, we're going to get 1.4. So we are done. We can say that this location of P it's at the coordinate value of 4, 1.4. In question 29, we have a triangle, ABC, and we have some measurements of it. AB, it's a length of 5, AC, it's a length of 12, and angle A, it's 90 degrees. Let's draw this triangle. So AB is 5, that's the side on the left hand side. AC is 12, that's the bottom side, and we have an angle of 90 degrees. So let's place that in there. And then in addition, we have another triangle, which also has a measurement of 90 degrees, but the sides of DF is 12, and the side of EF is 13. Let's draw that. So angle D is 90, let's place that in there. DF is 12, which is the bottom, and EF is 13, which is a hypotenuse. And having these two right triangles, then there's this person called Brett, and she's claiming that these two triangles are congruent to each other. And then in addition, that they are similar as well. Is this person correct? Because we do have two right triangles. Let's apply the Pythagorean theorem to find the missing side. So in triangle ABC, we'll have 5 squared plus 12 squared. And that will be equal to the hypotenuse, which we do not know. And I know that that's a hypotenuse because that's what's in front of 90 degrees. This is going to give me 25, 144, and that will be c squared. And when we combine those two, that's 169 equals to c squared. And when we take the square root of that, the hypotenuse is 13. So let's place that in here. So now let's find the missing side on the triangle in the right. We will have 12 squared plus b squared, and that's equal to 13 squared. 13 is a hypotenuse, since it's in front of 90 degrees. 12 squared is 144, then we'll have b squared, and 13 squared is 169. So let's subtract 144 on both sides. Let's do the computation here on the side. So that's going to give me b squared equals to 25. And the square root of 25, it is just 5. So let's place that down in here. So after this computation, notice that all sides are congruent to each other. On the left-hand side, both triangles have 5. On the bottom, both triangles have 12. And as hypotenuse, both triangles have 13. So at least in terms of being congruent, that is true. Both triangles are going to be congruent by side-side-side congruency theorem. But now, how about similarity? Well, if you have two triangles or two figures that are congruent to each other, they will always be similar. They will have a scale factor of one. So it is true that they're also similar. So this implies that this person, Brett, was correct because those two statements were true. Let's look at the next question. In question 30, we have that the volume of a triangular prism is 70 inches cubed. The base of this prism, it's a right triangle. So let's start with that. Let's draw a right triangle. Let's make that 90 degrees. But within this right triangle, we know that one of the legs has a measurement of 5 inches. Let's make that be the one on the left hand side. And notice that this measurement of 5 inches cannot be for the section in the bottom because that will be the hypotenuse. And here we're saying that the leg is the one who has 5 inches in length. And that's all we know about the base. We are also given that the height of the prism is 4 inches. So now let's draw our prism then. Now let's place the height to be a 4. 
And what we would like to know is to determine the length in inches of the other leg in the triangle. Meaning, when we take a look at the base of our triangle, what is the length of the missing side in the right hand side? Not the hypotenuse, but the second leg in the base. Well, let's see. Because we're given that the volume of this prism is 70 inches to the third, then let's consider the volume of this triangular prism, where the volume is being defined as the area of the base. times the height. Well, the base is a triangle. So the area of a triangle is one half times the base of the triangle times the height. And in this case, the height of this prism is four inches. So might as well put them there. And now when we concentrate on the base of our triangle, because we have 90 degrees on this intersection, then one of the legs is the base, and the second leg is the height. So now let's plug this information in our formula. The base, it is one half times the base, which is five, times the height, which is what we're looking for. And all this, let's multiply it times four. But it's a good thing that we know what the volume is. Don't forget, that was 70 inches cubed. So let's plug that in there. And on the right-hand side, when we get one half, and we multiply times 5, and we multiply times 4, that is going to give us 10. So we're going to have 10 times what we're looking for, which is the value of L. And to solve for L, let's divide it by 10. Well, let's not just call it 7. Let's put the units, let's call it inches. Now we're done. Let's take a look at the next question. In question 31, we're being given a triangle ABC with the following coordinate points, negative 2, 5, or 2, and negative 8, 1, which you can see in the graph here below. What we would like to know is, what is the area of this triangle? Well, when we have a figure in a coordinate plane, we can find the area by identifying the vertex of that figure, which is ABC and enclosing this figure in a quadrilateral. Because this is a quadrilateral, notice that all the edges of this quadrilateral are going to be of 90 degrees. And to find the area of this triangle, what we are going to do, we're going to find the area of the quadrilateral that we created. And then we're going to subtract the area of those two right triangles that are not in the triangle, but are in the rectangle. And when we do that, we're going to get the area of the orange triangle. So let's do that. Let's start by finding the area of the rectangle. It is base times height, where the base. It is equal to 12 and the height, it is equals to 6. We can just count the squares. And that's going to give us a total of 72. So now let's call this triangle, triangle 1. Let's find the area of triangle 1. The area, it's always equal to 1 half times the base times the height. Where in this case, the base, it is equal to 6. And the height, it is equal to 6 as well. And when we compute this, that is 18. Let's call this upper right triangle, triangle 2. Let's find the area of that. So it's going to be 1 half times the base, which is equal to 6, times the height, which is equal to 3. And that's going to be equal to 9. And now let's call this other triangle, triangle 3. So we're going to have 1 half times the base, which is equal to 3, times the height, which is equal to 12. And that's going to give us 18 as well. So now that we have all this information, let's find the area of the orange triangle. So 
So it was the area of the rectangle, 72. And now let's subtract the area of all those triangles. 18, 9, and 18. And this is going to give us 27. We do not know what units we're using, so let me just call this unit square. Because area is what we're looking for, your result should be given in a second dimension, some type of units to the second exponent. Let's take a look at the next question. In question 32, we have a scenario where Sally and Mary both were given ice cream from an ice cream truck, where Sally's ice cream was served in a cylinder, and this cylinder had a diameter of 4 centimeters and a total height of 8 centimeters, which is represented here on the left. And Mary's ice cream was served as a cone with a diameter of 7 centimeters and a height of 12.5 centimeters, which is represented here on the right. And let's assume that the ice cream, it fills Sally's cylinder and Mary's cone. So we want to determine and state how much more it served in the larger ice cream than the smaller ice cream to the nearest cubic centimeters. Because we can assume that the ice cream, it fills Sally's cylinder and Mary's cone, if you want to determine how much more they were serving ice cream, then what we need to do, we need to compare volumes, the volume of a cylinder and the volume of a cone. Let's start with the cylinder or Sally's ice cream. Remember that the volume of a cylinder, it is pi r squared times the height. Well, r, it is the radius of the base. When we take a look at our base, it has a diameter of 4 centimeters. So if we would like the radius, then it's half of that. So the radius of the cylinder is 2. So we'll square that, and then we need to multiply by the height of the cylinder, which is given to us as 8. And when we put all this in our graphing calculator, we're going to get 100.5 centimeters cubed. So now let's find the volume of the cone to see how much ice cream Mary was given. The volume of a cone, it is always equal to one third pi r squared times the height of the cone. Well, when it comes to the radius, it is the radius of the circle that is on the top of the cone. Well, here we're given that the diameter is of seven centimeters. The radius is half, so we're going to get as 3.5 as the radius of this cone. And when it comes to the height, it is the height of the cone, which is 12.5. And when we put all this in a graphing calculator, we're going to get 160.4 centimeters cubed. So when we compare both ice creams, it is clear that Mary got more ice cream. 160.4, it is greater than 100.5. So we can start by answering the question on the bottom. Who will serve more ice cream? Well, it is Mary. And now we want to determine how much more Mary was given. Well, let's find the difference of those two. 160.4 minus 100.5. And that's going to give us approximately 60 centimeters cubed. Let's take a look at the next question. In question 33, we're being given a triangle AEB, which you can see it here on the left hand side, and triangle DFC. which you can see it on the right hand side. And within these two triangles, there's this line segment that connects points A, B, C, D, which you can see it here in the middle. And when it comes to the side, line segment A, E, it's parallel to D, F. So let's place that in our diagram. So A, E is parallel to D, F, which is the one here at the bottom. And also E, B is parallel to F, C. And also, AC is congruent to DB. So the length from A all the way down to C, 
is the same from D all the way down to B. And what we would like to do, we would like to show that these two triangles are congruent to each other. So let's set up our statement and reason table. But before we jump into the proof, we need to have a strategy. Remembering that what we want to show is that two triangles are congruent to each other, then we will be using some of the triangle congruency theorems, either side, 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 either side, angle, side, either angle, side, angle, or either angle, angle, side. I'm not taking in consideration the HL congruency theorem because we don't seem to be having a right triangle. But if we want to use any of these congruency statement theorems, then we're going to take a look at the triangles and we are going to try to find congruent sides and congruent angles. So that's our strategy. So now let's try to find those in the diagram. Any statement in recent table should always start with the givens. So let's write that down. Now I'm going to start by trying to find congruent angles. Because when we are being given parallel lines, we can always obtain congruent angles from those. So I'm going to start by considering the parallel lines of AE and FD. We notice that we have a transversal from that, the line that connects all those points, A, B, C, D. And when we do that, I can identify two congruent angles. This angle, which I'm going to call A, and this angle, which I'm going to call D. They are alternate interior angles. So let me write that down. And now when I consider the other set of parallel lines, EB and CF, I can still consider the same transversal. Now to make it better to see, let me extend those lines. Because when I do that, notice that this angle of EBA, it is an alternate exterior angle to angle DCF. We can say that they are congruent to each other. This is essentially a scenario that we have. We have a transversal. We have two parallel lines. And the triangle on the left is the one that we have here. And the triangle on the right is the one that we have here. They're alternate exterior angles. Where here we have our two parallel lines. And when I consider this section of congruency between AC and DB, which is shown here in blue, notice that both sections have BC in common. So let me state that BC is congruent to itself by reflexive property. So now let's consider the following. AC is congruent to BD. And if I take the length of BC on both of those sections, then we can claim that AB is congruent to CD. So let's put that in our diagram. AB is congruent to CD. And at this point, we can stop because the triangle on the left, AEB, and the triangle on the right, DCF, they are congruent. Notice that now they have angle, side, angle, which is one of the statements that we were considering. So we are done. Let's take a look at the next question. In question 34, we have that Barry wants to find the height of a tree that is modeled below. And we're given that angle C, it's a red angle, 
which we have it here. And at the angle elevation from point A to the top of the tree, it's 40 degrees, which we have it here. And the angle of elevation from point B to the top of the tree, it is 80 degrees, which we have it here. And we are also given that the distance from A to B, it is 85 feet, which we have it here. Now, at first, Barry makes the claim that ABH, it's an isosceles triangle. Well, let's start by identifying what is triangle ABH. Now, if we want to show that we have an isosceles triangle, there's two ways of doing that. Either we can show that we have two congruent sides, or we can show that we have two congruent angles. Well, let's see. I mean, the first thing that I notice is that we have angle 80 in here. Well, if I consider the whole line, then I know that the angle of 80 plus this angle in green, it should be equal to 180 degrees. But if the red is already 80, then the green, it must be 100. And when I go back to the triangle that we were considering, notice that I already know two angles the angle of 100 and the angle that we were given as 40 degrees. Then we can find the measurement of angle of H, which is the angle that we have here in blue. The summation of the three interior angles, it should be equal to 180 degrees. So to find H, we can do 180 minus 40 minus 100. So we can claim that angle H is equivalent to 40 degrees. And I just noticed that I need to be a little more careful. I shouldn't call this just angle H. Let me call it properly. Let me call it A, H, B. And now we can make the conclusion that the triangle ABH, it is isosceles because we have two congruent interior angles within the triangle that we were considering. We have two angles of 40 degrees, then we can claim that ABH is an isosceles triangle. In the second part, we want to determine what is the height of the tree. Well, height, it must be perpendicular to the ground. So in other words, we need to find the line segment of HC. Well, let's use the fact that we already know but the triangle in yellow, it's isosceles. Because in an isosceles triangle, those sides which are opposite of congruent angles are going to be congruent. So AB, it is 85 feet. Then therefore, HB, it's also 85 feet. And when I do that, now I can concentrate on the triangle in the right. Because this little triangle in the right, it has the line segment that we will consider for the height of the triangle, HC. So let me draw that triangle individually here in the bottom. So we have that angle C, it is 90 degrees. And also we were given that angle B, it is 80 degrees. And we have just shown that the line segment of BH is 85. And remember that HC is what we're looking for. Since we do have a right triangle, we can use some of the trigonometric functions. So let's label our triangle. HC will be the opposite of 80 degrees. The length of 85, it will be our hypotenuse. It is in front of 90 degrees. And the line segment in the bottom, it is the adjacent. So now let's think about what function we can use where we can find an opposite where we have the hypotenuse. So that will be the sine function. Sine is defined as opposite over hypotenuse. So let's use the sine function. The sine of our reference angle, which is 80 degrees, it is equal to the opposite, which is HC, the height of the tree, divided by the hypotenuse, which is 85. Now we can solve for HC. Let's multiply 85 to both sides. Now that's gone. And therefore HC, 
which is the height of the tree, it will be equal to 85 times the sine of 80 degrees. And when we place this down in our graphing calculator, it is approximately 84 feet. So now we can set the height of the tree. It's 84 feet. Now let's take a look at the next question. In question 35, we are being given three coordinate points, D, U, C. At negative 3, negative 1, negative 1, comma 8, and at 8, comma 6. And what we'd like to show is that these three coordinate points create a right triangle. Well, let's start by visualizing these coordinate points. Negative 1, comma 8, it's somewhere around here, so that is point U. 8, comma 6, it's somewhere around here. So let's call that point C. And negative 3, negative 1, it's somewhere around here. So let's call that point D. So this is the triangle that we want to show that is a right triangle. Well, if we want to show that we have a right triangle, we need to show that one of the interior angles is 90 degrees. In other words, we need to show that there are two lines that are perpendicular to each other. But now let's think about how we can show that we have perpendicular lines. Well, we can show that there are two lines that have a negative reciprocal. Slope. So that's our strategy. Let's find the slope of each of these three lines. And if we identify that there's at least one pair who share a negative reciprocal, then we can say that we have a right angle. Then we can say that we have a right triangle. Well, let's start with the line segment DU. The slope, it is the difference of the y's. So I'm going to do negative 1 minus 8. The bottom of I the difference of the x's. So I'm going to go to negative 3 minus negative 1. On the top, we're going to get negative 9. On the bottom, we're going to get negative 2. And when we simplify, that's 9 over 2. So now let's find the slope of the next line, uc. It is the difference of the y's. So we're going to have 6 minus 8. And then I'm going to divide by the difference of the x's. 8 minus negative 1. And when I combine in the top, we get negative 2. And at the bottom, we get positive 9. And when we simplify, that is negative 2 over 9. But at this point, we can stop. Because when we take a look at the slope of du, which is 9 over 2, and we take a look at the slope of uc, which is negative, 2 over 9, they have negative reciprocal slopes. So that means that the intersection was 90 degrees. So that means that we have a right angle inside this triangle. Then that's enough to claim that DUC is a right triangle. So now let's look at the second part of this question. Within the same scenario, now let's say that point U is reflected over the line segment DC and we create an image point U prime. And with that, we are forming a quadrilateral. Now what we want to show is that this quadrilateral is actually a square. So let's start by placing the points that we were given. Remember that U was at negative 1, comma 8. C was at 8, 6. And D was at negative 3, comma, negative 1. So now let's create our triangle. Now in our direction, we are saying that point U 
which is the one that we have here. It is reflected over the line segment DC. So now let's think about how we're going to find the image of U prime. U reflected over the line segment DC. Well, let me choose one point in the line that is being reflected. Let me find how many units I need to move to the right to get to that point, which in this case, it is nine. Well, that's how many units I am going to be moving vertically from point C. From U to go to C, if I need to move nine units to the right, after the reflection, we will be moving nine units down. And now to go to C, I also need to be moving two units down. Well, after the reflection, we're going to move in two units to the left. So now let's form our quadrilateral DUC U prime. Now, if we want to show that this quadrilateral it's a square, then we need to show that all sides are congruent to each other. But I can tell that the length of UC and C and U prime, they are congruent to each other because they are both the hypotenuse of a right triangle who has a leg of 9 and 2 on both sides. 9 and 2 as well. But when I consider the line segment of D and U prime, I have the same result. So go to D all the way to U prime, I need to move two units down and I need to move nine units to the right. So we have the same right triangle. And the same goes when I take a look at the line segment of UD. It is a hypotenuse of a right triangle who has a leg of nine and who has a leg of two. So this is the triangle that we had in every single section. A right triangle with a length of two and a length of nine. And if we use the Pythagorean theorem, two square it is equals to four, nine square is eighty-one, and that's our hypotenuse, where the hypotenuse are the sides that we are interested, in, either the one on the right, or the bottom, or the left, or the right. And now we can claim that x squared it is equal to 85. So therefore, x it is the square root of 85. Every single side of the quadrilateral duc u prime has a length of square root of 85. Then that is sufficient to say that it is a square. So we are done. Hello, if you would like to continue learning about mathematics, you can check out the videos on the left.